Good afternoon. Um, my name is Alan Davidson, and I am the director of the Open Technology Institute here at the New America Foundation. Uh, on behalf of all of us at New America, I am delighted to welcome you all here today. This happens to be my fourth day on the job, so uh, uh, this is actually the first one of these kind of assemblies here at New America that I've had the pleasure to introduce, and I am really especially delighted to be talking about internet governance, which is a topic near to my heart and um, essential to the work that we do here at the Open Technology Institute. Uh, for some ne years now, uh, the topic of internet governance has uh, excited the minds of communication policy wonks and constitutional scholars and international lawyers. Uh, few others in the general public have shared that enthusiasm, uh, I should say. Uh, Acronyms like the ITU or ICANN or IETF, you know, chip off the tongues of us governance wonks, but uh, the long-term impact of these groups uh, is more likely to be intuitively obvious to insiders than to the public or to policymakers around the world. We have a hard time explaining why people should care about this. Uh, I think that dynamic is beginning to change. Uh, in the last year or two, we've seen internet governance issues increasingly emerging on the global political stage. It's easy to see why. Uh, the internet matters a lot more in people's lives. Uh, it's becoming clear that internet governance matters in their lives too. These governance bodies, the kinds that we're going to talk about today, are centrally located in the debate about free speech online, about the future of the domain name system, uh, which even my mother begins beginning to understand a little bit. Um, the, uh, the issues around government surveillance in the wake of the Snowden disclosures. The future of groups like the ITU or ICANN is now a much bigger deal to average people. And finally, the outcome of these debates, the debates we're going to be talking about today, remains in doubt. For the first few decades of the Internet's existence, it was easy to take its architecture and its biases uh, towards freedom and openness. It was easy to take those for granted. Today, those n are no longer a given. Um, and the technologies of freedom and opportunity we're seeing can often be turned into technologies of control. As the next two billion people come online, not all of them will be coming with the same tradition of American or Western democratic values that informed the Internet's early development. What kind of internet governance will they want? What kind of internet governance will the next two billion people online want to build? So I would just say our event today could not be more well-timed, even though we've been working on it for a little while. Um, the multi-stakeholder model that has governed the network of networks, its technical aspects, and the policies that affect it is now under great stress. We've seen powerful, sometimes non-democratic uh, governments challenging this model of government. There have been calls for the ITU to expand its regulatory reach to the upper layers of the Internet. And here at home, there have been mixed reactions to the recent department, that might be a generous term, uh, mixed reactions to the recent Department of Commerce announcement about the transition of the IANA function to a new uh, global multi-stakeholder community. Uh, this year, there are a number of crucial meetings that will shape the direction of governments, including the Net Mundial meetings later this month, and the ITU plenipotentiary later this year. So into this complex but important set of issues and meetings and conversations comes Laura Denardis's excellent new volume, I guess not so new either, but excellent volume, uh, The Global War for Internet Governance. And in simple terms, it spells out both the stakes in this debate and it gives us a roadmap to understand the major structures that are having an impact on it. My colleague, Rebecca McKinnon, who's a senior, uh, senior advisor here at the New America Foundation, recently called it required reading for those seeking to understand the basics of internet governance. And I wholeheartedly agree. I'm delighted, uh, and we are all delighted, that Laura's here uh, to share uh, her insights with us. Uh, we're also glad to both welcome Laura here today, but also have this distinguished and insightful panel of people working in the field uh, to share their observations. A few quick housekeeping notes. First, uh, today's event is being live streamed and a recording of the panel 
will be available on the New America website after the event, so tell all your friends. Uh, second, for those who are uh, both who are in the room and watching online, we encourage you to continue the conversation on Twitter, and we're using the hashtag pound net governance. So give that a try. Okay, so finally, to introduce our speaker more fully and our panel, I'm delighted to turn things over to Carolina Rossini. She is a project director here at the New America Foundation for the Internet Freedom Program. And uh, unfortunately, I'm afraid to say she will soon be leaving us for public knowledge, not very far away, but uh, um, it uh, is good to see her still in the space. So, um, and I should say, Carolina also just recently testified yesterday in the House Commerce Committee hearing on internet governance, so she is fully primed uh, for all of your comments and questions and to be a provocateur, I hope, today. So, on behalf of New America, thank you for being here. Thank you to our panel and to Laura, and uh, I look forward to a great discussion. So I want to be sure to jump directly in the fun part of this, which is our debate with our guests. But before, uh, I want to introduce Laura and everybody else and explain a little bit the dynamic we like here. So Laura is going to present a little bit in her book. Then we're going to have the other guests speaking a little bit, commenting on her book. And then we're going to open for informal conversation. So we, we should feel that we are all in the, same, in the same living room. We do have Coke outside, but unfortunately, we don't have beer right now. Uh, so I'm going to open, I'm going to make some discussions and hope you guys enjoy and, and enjoy the debate. So Laura here at my side, um, uh, we met many years ago and I was very privileged to work with her. I was still in Brazil and she was at then at TAO. Uh, she's an internet governance scholar and a professor and associate dean in the School of Communications at American University. Uh, her books include, include the, wa uh, the Global War for Internet Governance, Opening Standards, The Global Politics of Interoperability for, uh, by MIT Press, uh, Protocol Politics, and Information Technology in Theory. She's a senior fellow at the Center for Inter uh, International Governments Innovation, the CG, and holds an international appointment as the director of the research for the Global Commission on Internet Governance announced at the World Economic Forum recently. She served as the executive director for the Information Society project at WIEO and has degrees on um, um, engineer and a postdoctoral fellowship from Yale Law School. Uh, Benoni Belli, my Brazilian colleague at the panel, uh, is a minister counselor at the Embassy of Brazil in Washington. And in DC, he's in charge of congressional affairs, cooperation with the US states and local governments, and additionally, press and public diplomacy. Mr. Bielli, previous assignment includes the Brazilian mission to UN in New York, where he worked with human rights issues, uh, the Embassy of Brazil in Buenos Aires, and the Embassy of Brazil in Algiers. In Brasilia, he worked at the Human Rights Department and at the South American Bureau. Then we're going to have uh, Richard uh, Beard. Sorry. <laughs> Richard is the Senior International Policy Advisor at Willey Ring. Um, advocacy. Uh, Dr. Bird was formerly a uh, senior deputy of United States Coordinator for International Communications and Information Policy and the Office Director for Multilateral Affairs within the U.S. Department of State. Uh, he also served at the Department of State, was, ser uh, was founder of the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation of APEC Forum on Telecommunications working, uh, working Group and has multiple decades experience of of, uh, with the OECD. He was the first official uh, from the United States to be elected as the chair for the International Telecommunications <coughs> Union's Council, the ITU. And finally, my colleague Emma Lelson from the Center of Technology uh, for Democracy and Technology Free Expression Project, which works to promote uh, policies that support users' free expression rights in the United States and around the world. Emma joined CDT in 2009. Uh, has the Bruce Ennis First Amendment Expression and Global Internet Policy um, Fellow. She helped lead CDT work around uh, ITU uh, 2012 Wicked Conference, uh, and she has advocated to maintain the decentralized multi-stakeholder model of internet governance. I'm very proud uh, to say that Emma and I, we work uh, really well together through an international um, group that's called Best Beats. Uh, Emma has a JD for, from Yale Law School, and she has been also admitted to the New York State Bar. So I would just like to 
dive directly in our debate and ask questions later. So, Laura, please. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm absolutely delighted to be here. I want to thank the New America Foundation for hosting this event. And I'm just completely honored to be part of this panel with my colleagues, some great thinkers. The new book is called The Global War for Internet Governance. And I decided to select a provocative title because I really do believe that some of the debates over internet governance are spaces where political and economic power is working itself out in the 21st century. As Alan already said, internet control points exist and they mediate civil liberties such as freedom of expression and privacy. They affect national security. They affect global innovation policy. But this has been traditionally such a technically and institutionally concealed area and somewhat arcane that it has been to a certain extent outside of public view. But there are a lot of controversies that have changed this in the last few years. Think about the last um, four years alone. We had WikiLeaks. Then we had Hillary Clinton's now famous internet freedom speech at the museum right around the corner where she called on American corporations to push back against requests of repressive governments for surveillance and censorship. And then we had the cognitive dissonance of looking at that speech versus the uh, more recent disclosures about expansive NSA surveillance. Of course, we had the Egyptian internet outage, we had GhostNet, the Great Firewall of China, too many denial of service attacks to recount. And now we have the open question of how to transition United States authority over the root of the internet to a more international entity, if I can call it entity. We don't know what it will be yet. So at the same time that we have every aspect of our economic and social life completely dependent upon this infrastructure, we have somewhat of a loss of trust a loss of trust in technology, in governments, and by default, to some extent, the institutions that manage and coordinate cyber infrastructure. So hence the rising political attention to internet governance, which is just making uh, life more interesting by the day. But one point to make is that the internet is already governed. But there's no single system of coordination. And one of the reasons that I wrote this book is to try to explain and disaggregate this concept internet governance into various layers and to explain what is at stake in these. So one area, for example, involves control of critical internet resources. So that would include domain names and the administration of things like autonomous system numbers. I won't get into what that is and what you've heard of internet addresses, binary numbers. Now the requirement for each of these to be globally unique has brought about a certain form of governance, in some cases centralized governance. And the global struggle over who controls and oversees this is not a new issue. This has been going on for a very long time. Tensions have ref reflected US versus United Nations control and especially struggles over control of the root zone file which is uh, in, it's described by some as the center of the internet, which is a little bit of an exaggeration, but it is the authoritative mapping between top level domains and associated IP addresses. So there are a lot of new institutions in this area, which is why it's so interesting. It transcends national boundaries. ICANN is one of them, the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers. Um, everyone has heard of ICANN. It's a nonprofit corporation um, incorporated in the state of California. Now, this is a technical area. <coughs> I, I have uh, a background in engineering, and I love the technology of it. But the work that I do identifies the politics in the technology. And what are some of the public policy issues that arise over critical internet resources, just to name a few? One is, of course, adjudicating domain name trademark disputes. When you have a domain name like united.com, who should own that? United Airlines, United Arab Emirates, the Manchester United, United Van Lines, and who should decide? When we authorize new top-level domains, freedom of, of speech is at stake, as well as spaces for innovation, as well as concerns for companies that have trademarks and have new spaces in which to enforce trade their trademark rights. So 
Is it okay to have dot triple X? Is it okay to have dot Republican? Is it okay to have dot sucks? Is it okay to have dot gay? When someone introduced dot gay, the Saudi Arabian government said, well, we would rather not have that top level domain. So you can see the kinds of free speech issues that arise in cyberspace over this. And of course, still the larger problem is the impasse over the oversight of this mapping and the uh, historic relationship between the Department of Commerce and uh, this function and, the, and transitioning to a new form of oversight. So it's both technically complicated and it's also political. But one point I'd like to make is that this is only one area of internet governance and it's not the whole internet, despite how some in the press are, are portraying it. it's not the whole internet, it's one part. And I decided in this book, knowing full well that there's been so much attention to this area, to make that one chapter. And I made it the second chapter after the introduction and then the rest of the book, book explains other critical areas of internet governance. So just to name a few of these, technical standards, People's eyes are glazing over at the, the sound of it, technical standards. But it's a very important area of oversight of the internet. Uh, many are household names. Wi-Fi, MP3 is an audio compression standard. HTTP, Bluetooth. These are all standards, and they're designed by a number of institutions, such as the Internet Engineering Task Force and the World Wide Web Consortium. And they're very technical. It, we, you could read standards, um, they're blueprints. They're not actually software code or hardware, but they're blueprints that you can read. And uh, a thesis of, um, of my book, which drew from my doctoral dissertation advisor, Janet Abate, who wrote Inventing the Internet in 1999, is that protocols are politics by other means. So how can these kinds of technical standards affect policy? Well, you, you, you don't have to look farther than encryption standards, which often mediate between national security and individual privacy. A protocol like BitTorrent, there's another example, that is, uh, it serves a technical function of efficient file sharing, but we link that always with piracy in our minds. So it's, it's politicized because of its usage. And of course, other standards uh, affect things like access to the internet for the disabled. So it's a very important area. And whereas these, um, and I'll, I'm, I'm going to uh, channel my friend Alan Davidson, who's written extensively about this. And whereas these kinds of standards set public policy, then the manner in which they're set is a procedural matter that is a form of governance. And so having openness, transparency, and participation in this uh, it speaks to the issue of public policy legitimacy. So that's another area of internet governance. And perhaps more obvious is cybersecurity governance. Beginning with the 1988 Morris Worm, uh, how many remember the Morris Worm of 1988? Many in here. To the more recent um, Stuxnet code targeting nuclear control systems internet security attacks have become increasingly more sophisticated. Much of the responsibility in this area, as in other areas of internet governance, rests with the private sector. Companies that run infrastructure and that secure their own transactional services and data. But there's also an area that involves pr public-private oversight, such as computer emergency response teams and certificate authorities and a number of institutions that serve as trusted third parties that are responsible for handling the authentication of our transactions when I go to buy something on Amazon.com. It also involves security of actual internet governance technologies. So how do we secure the domain name system? How do we secure the systems of routing and addressing? It's a very um, technical area, but uh, we take it for granted sometimes because the internet has worked so well. It's not an easy area, though, securing those kinds of infrastructures that we rely on. Another area, I just want to, to toss out a few uh, that maybe can be food for thought for some of the discussion. Interconnection governance. I, eyes glaze over again. Interconnection governance. Um, everyone knows that the internet is not actually a cloud, but is a series of conjoined networks that involve private industry making decisions to interconnect with each other. Um, it's, it involves uh, technical and financial arrangements, many of which um, are just privately negotiated. 
recently in the news, this there was some attention to this area because of the Netflix and Comcast uh, decision to directly connect their network. So it's a it's an interconnection issue. And um, is is it a net neutrality issue? Should net neutrality be brought into this area? Uh, there's a lot of uh, pressure from around the world to have regulation of this area. What should that look like? What will that do to the pace of innovation and to the rights of corporations versus having public oversight of an area with a lot of public interest um, issues? So again, lots of lots of policy issues there. And then we have the area of the, the role of private companies, the role of private information intermediaries, such as search engines, information aggregation sites like YouTube and Flickr, <coughs> and reputation systems like Yelp that provide free services to us, and they're monetized through online advertising, but all of them establish public policy. Whether th you think about the uh, constantly changing privacy policies of social media companies. I have all of my students read every single letter of all the privacy agreements and uh, study how they change over time. Or decisions of an information intermediary to remove hate speech. Or a decision to f comply with or not um, a, a, a request of a government to remove information. So a lot of issues there in which um, private companies are, um, are establishing a form of governance through their content intermediation. And of course, um, intellectual property is another area that I won't get into in great detail. It's a subject of a 10-hour discussion with this crowd. But um, it, it doesn't just involve uh, protection of copyrighted material and of trademarks, but also the embedded intellectual property that exists in infrastructures of internet governance. So there are patents on standards. There's, there are domain name trademark disputes and rights, and there's the issue of trade secrecy in many areas of internet infrastructure, such as um, search engine algorithms, just to name one. So my new book tries to address what is at stake in all of these areas, and uh, I think what I'll do is um, I'll, just, I'll just close with three themes that kind of tie all of that together. The first theme in this book and actually that un underscores all of the uh, research that I do, is that arrangements of technical architecture are also arrangements of power. The complex institutional and technical scaffolding of internet governance is behind the scenes, not visible in the same way as our devices, our content, our applications. But nevertheless, they do embed political and cultural tensions. And um, after um, a career in uh, information engineering and a background educationally in information engineering, I decided to get a doctoral degree in a field called science and technology studies. And that is a, an entire field that examines the cultural and political embeddedness of technology. So I enjoy doing this very much. So the, uh, the politics of the technology. Internet protocols are politics in both their design and their effects. Even routine bandwidth inspection techniques and network management can be politically charged when they rely on invasive content and inspection techniques like deep packet inspection that opens up a packet and looks at what's inside. So changing, if, if one believes this, that the, the technical is technical, but it's also political and economic, then uh, when you think about changing the technology's architecture, what you're doing is changing forms of politics and structures of society and creating possibilities for both different forms of governance and unanticipated outcomes. A second theme is that internet governance infrastructures are increasingly becoming proxies for content control and for broader political battles. Traditional intellectual property rights enforcement based on uh, notice and takedown or suing individuals has done little to stop piracy. So there's a turn to infrastructure using the domain name system for that. Many governments have lost control of, of the content within their borders, so they are turning to infrastructure to block flows. The best example of that is in um, either Egypt or Syria. So the truth is that global internet choke points do exist. Despite the decentralized geography of the internet, 
And despite the diversity of institutions overseeing this infrastructure, there are centralized points of control. And all are increasingly recognized as points of control over content mediation. There's no doubt about that. And then the, the final theme is that we have a privatization of internet governance. Obviously, governments perform many internet oversight functions. I'm not trying to suggest that they don't. Regulating computer fraud and abuse, uh, performing antitrust oversight, uh, responding to internet security threats, enforcing child protection laws, enacting privacy laws. There are many examples of this, developing national and regional statutes. But in reality, most internet governance has been carried out by the private sector through technical design and through new institutional forms and through information intermediation by a private company. So private companies are doing this not in just carrying out their core functions, but they're being asked to be on the front lines of content mediation, for example, by governments. So there's delegated censorship, delegated enforcement. Governments ask search engines to remove links. They approach social media companies to remove defamatory material. They ask internet service providers to hand over personal information about their subscribers for law enforcement or political reasons. Delegated censorship, delegated surveillance, delegated enforcement, delegated copyright enforcement have shifted governance into the private sector and into these private intermediaries. So the truth is that the, um, that the internet is governed. But another point I would like to make is that this governance is not fixed any more than technical architecture is fixed. There are many global debates underway now. We're going to discuss some of them in this panel. But there's not one global debate. There are global debates. If one believes that there are many layers of internet governance, and when you understand the technical architecture, it's very easy to see that, there are many debates. So when I get the, asked the question, as many of you do, a question such as this, who should run the internet? It doesn't make any sense on its face. Should Google run it? Should, should the ITU run the internet? Should the US government run the in internet? Or should ICANN? Um, it's a non sequitur, and it stems from this misconception that internet governance is monolithic. Um, there are many other open questions, too. I mentioned the one about interconnection. Uh, there's the question of the future of anonymity online. There's the ever-present concern about moving from a relatively universal internet into a more fragmented internet. You could argue if uh, someone would raise their hand immediately and say, well, wait, we don't have a universal internet now. What if you don't speak English? You have a very different view in different areas of the world. There are, are bandwidth constraints. There are filtering systems, all kinds of ways that we may not have a universal internet at the content level. But at the technical level, we have all the building blocks uh, for internet universality. Now, there is increasing concern about this even very recently, post Snowden, we've seen reactions ranging from wanting to route around US internet exchange points to localization of customer data in certain countries to having nation-specific cloud services. So I'm an advocate of a universal internet. I know not everyone is, but do we want to be concerned about this possibility of fragmentation? Is this really a possibility? It's an, an issue that I raise in the book. So a closely related challenge, and I'll just end with this, is the question of the appropriate balance of powers between various stakeholders, such as in the US oversight transition. What would be a worst case scenario, in, in my opinion, would be a transformation from roughly what we have right now, which is multi-stakeholder internet governance to multilateral internet governance. At the same time, we can't have this word, multi-stakeholderism, be the answer to every problem that we raise and every issue in internet governance. So it's time to unpack the word multi-stakeholderism, which is the basic idea of shared coordination among private industry, governments, and civil society. But 
it can't be a value in itself. It has to be something that meets more uh, salient public interest objectives for some reason. So I wrote this book to try to provide some insights into this geopolitics of internet governance and how it works right now, as well as the history of it, and raise some of the debates that will shape the future of the internet and therefore the future of internet freedom. And I do think that these debates are important and I, in, it's a wonderful thing that there's more public attention to it and growing policymaker attention to this because the security and the stability of the internet really should rank among other global collective action problems like environmental rights, human rights, and basic infrastructural systems of uh, food and water. Because if w we have now the pu a public sphere that is technically mediated and we have this technical mediation that is uh, run through private intermediation and um, always forces of control uh, from repressive governments wanting to, to push content control in a certain way versus forces of freedom that want to r keep the internet open. So I do feel that it's important. I'm very honored to be here today at the New America Foundation uh, with my friends Carolina Rossini and with Alan Davidson and with this wonderful panel. So I will end there. I very much look forward to the discussion and thank you very much. Thank you, Laura. I have always feel extremely honored to hear you speaking and putting so much straightforwardness on a lot of things that sound so complicated sometimes. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen her uh, last paper in NSSRN, uh, unpacking, unpacking the multi-stakeholderism process. Rethinking multi, multi yes. When I read that paper, I said, wow, she was able to put in one table that you can print in one page all the bodies that govern some layers of the internet. So I immediately printed that and pasted on my wall. And it's actually there. <laughs> so I recommend you guys taking a look at that. It's really helpful. So now I would like to uh, pass the word to uh, my colleague Benoni Belli from Brazil. Um, and you, you are welcome to speak from there or from here, yes. Whatever you <coughs> Thank you very much. Uh, First of all, I would like to thank uh, Alan Davidson uh, and Carolina Rossini for the invitation to be here today with you. And of course, uh, I would like to thank Dr. Laura Denardis for the privilege to discuss her insightful book and for her uh, enlightening presentation here. Uh, of course, it's also a pleasure to be uh, with this distinguished panel and audience. Uh, I'm uh, a little bit uh, the outsider in this uh, room. Uh, all of you are experts, but sometimes it's, too, it's good to have uh, someone from outside to bring a different perspective as well. Uh, since internet governance is not an issue that uh, pertains only to the domain of uh, experts, it's now an issue that has, uh, at, you know, it's very important for uh, the whole society, governments and all stakeholders as you used to uh, call uh, those involved uh, directly with the issue. Um, uh, what I'd like to do uh, is to uh, highlight the aspects of the book that I think is are more uh, are, are really interesting or more interesting from my perspective. Of course, the whole book is interesting, but I had to make a few choices uh, based on my uh, uh, my background, and then I'll raise a little uh, a couple of questions and add a few more comments uh, of my own. Um, I think that, uh, uh, of course, the book is a very comprehensive analysis of the wide-ranging areas and mechanisms through which internet governance is shaped and manufactured. And I employ the words shape and manufacture to emphasize the idea that internet governance is not a natural phenomenon. Uh, it is not a God-given resource. It is, in fact, the outcome of negotiations, of struggles in a number of different areas. As Dr. Donardis points out, internet governance is a contested space reflecting broader global power struggles. I'd rather say, after reading the book, that the global war for internet governance is actually a set of different conflicts, battles, skirmishes, guerrilla wars, and even old-fashioned duels, depending on the context. Uh, it is still not an all-all 
war. And nor is it a war characterized, characterized by two clear-cut ca uh, camps, one representing values of democracy and progress, and another representing the forces of evil, authoritarianism, and backwardness. There are many shades of gray in these different struggles and conflicts. One of the most important merits of the book, in my view, is that it avoids the simplistic view of describing the war for internet governance as a fight between the good guys and the bad guys. This conflict uh, exists because the internet has become a very important source, of course, of economic and social power. Dr. Denardis quotes uh, Manuel Castells, who explained that communication, and I'm quoting, and information have been fundamental sources of power and counterpower of domination and social change. I think it's important to keep that in mind. The book also dispels the romantic idea of the internet architecture and governance as embodying democratic values of equality, openness, and multi-stakeholder oversight. These are ideals that are worth pursuing, for sure, but internet governance not always reflects such values and objectives. It becomes clear that internet governance is not always a positive social force and that without social context it is difficult to, to understand if it is positive or negative. Uh, the example provided by Dr. Nardis is really convincing, one of the examples of many that she provides. The ability to use filtering technologies to block child pornography, for instance, is not different from the use of, the, of technology to block political speech. The first question is how to determine that a particular governance outcome is good or bad. Well, if we were uh, talking about domestic governance here in the United States, for instance, uh, you have your national realities, uh, maybe the answer would be the domestic political system, it will the, 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 the local law, the regulations, those will be the uh, arbiters. But what about the global arena? And internet is global by its definition. Can international law play a role? This is the first question that I'd like to, to raise in this regard. Some would say that the answer is the multi-stakeholder approach, which ensures more transparency, participation of all those involved. Um, it is tempting to see multi-stakeholderism as a sort of panacea. Well, that can, uh, that can guarantee the best possible results for the interaction of, st of all stakeholders. Again, the important question is about determining the type of multi-stakeholderism that can better work for a number of different situations. Uh, I think that's another contribution that Dr. Denardis brings uh, for, for the discussion of these issues. Um, and I found particularly interesting that Dr. Denardis does not endorse the multi-stakeholder approach as a magic wand. Uh, for internet governance. She stresses that it's not a value in itself. Uh, she mentioned in the, her presentation here, it is also in the book. The right question is uh, what form of administration is necessary in any particular context? Uh, the answer is that certain areas of internet governance should be overseen by national governments or via international treaties. Other areas are administered by, uh, effectively administered by private sector or non-profit institutions, depending on each situation. Uh, the most interesting part of the book, uh, in my opinion, is this discu discussion about state multi-stakeholderism as a kind of zeitgeist uh, and the assertion that this concept can ob obfuscate uh, hidden agendas. Or it could become a race to the lowest common denominator in what is acceptable, for instance, as a democratic value. It seems that there is a tension in the book not fully resolved. It becomes clear when Dr. Donardis mentions the difference uh, between a top-down imposition of multi-stakeholderism with the risk of a race to the lowest common denominator and the way actual multi-stakeholder approaches organically grow in practice. It seems that the key to understand how the author sees that this tension lies in the assertion that the decentralized and distributed balance of power is likely responsible for the ongoing resilience, stability, and adaptability of the internet. F so from this uh, chaotic multi-stakeholder struggle for power in different arenas uh, of internet governance emerges this resilient, stable, and adaptable internet. From chaos uh, emerges order, despite the shortcomings of such orders, of course, uh, which is always an imperfect order. 
It would be interesting to hear from Dr. Bernardes how, in her view, we can avoid the pitfalls of the top-down imposition of multi-stakeholderism as we move forward. For instance, in the ongoing discussion at the United Nations, ITU, IGF, and the upcoming Global Conference on the Future of Internet Governance in Brazil. Dr. Denades reminds her readers that even in democratic countries, degrees of internet freedom related to privacy expression and individual autonomy are constantly negotiated against conflicting values of national security and law enforcement. The problem, once more, uh, is um, how to we, we undertake such negotiations at the international global level. It is not rare to hear that any enhanced role for such institutions uh, like uh, 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 multilateral institutions would mean empowering countries that are not democratic or giving them the capacity to influence the decision-making process about internet governance. I really think that such misgivings are sometimes exaggerated. It all depends on the specific issue uh, at hand. Uh, if uh, much stakeholderism is no panacea, uh, and if broadly defined it can obfus obfuscate power struggles, the rejection in limine of multilateralism can also become in practice a defense of the status quo. Multilateral institutions such as the UN are composed by diverse membership, but they also are composed by a huge number of democratic countries developing and developed, whose contributions to find common solutions are necessary and must be taken into account. Take, for instance, the recent resolution at the UN about right to privacy in our digital era, sponsored by Brazil and Germany. This resolution was an important stepping stone to build a universal consensus around the, the notion that internet governance is not just a technical issue, but also a human rights issue. This is not to say that multilateral institutions should be the only or even the most important decision-making mechanisms in every aspect of internet governance. Let me be very clear. There will be issues that must be dealt with in multilateral institutions while others, others while will require a different approach. Um, well, I think I have already, uh, but I have still two things to, to highlight. Uh, since uh, we scheduled this event for the first time, uh, two major event developments occurred. I think that's uh, worth mentioning here. The U.S. government has announced that uh, that we will start the, the preparation to relinquish its uh, remaining oversight authority in the area of the main name system. This decision has entailed a political debate we are familiar with. And the second, uh, and this, uh, of course, it would be great to know if Dr. Denardis could share her views on this issue, in particular, what are the prospects for the globalization of ICANN and how it could be carried out. I, I know that it's a very difficult question. Everyone is thinking about that, but it's in interesting to have her perspective on that. The second development I'd like to underline was the adoption uh, by the Brazilian Chamber of Deputies of the Marco Civil Bill, uh, it's our constitution uh, for in the Internet, which is also a very uh, important step. Uh, it uh, establishes a strong assertion of rights and principles for Internet governance that maybe could be inspiring for our discussions in the upcoming uh, meetings, global meetings. To conclude, let me go back to the idea of war for Internet governance. Uh, and I'd like to call the Israeli writer Amos Oz. I think he could be a source of inspiration here. Regarding the conflict uh, between Israelis and Palestinians, uh, Amos Oz declares that he is not a proponent of make love, not war. His stance has been make peace, not love. Because the opposite of war is not love, but peace. And peace requires pragmatism, negotiation, and sometimes painful concessions. We should not expect all stakeholders to love each other, but it is important to find common ground in the most important areas of internet governance. In other words, we should try to prevent this war uh, for internet governance from becoming bloody. We will not be able to overcome different values of com uh, and conflict of interest, of course, but we can try to build more efficient internet governance arrangements. The meeting in Brazil uh, is meant to be a contribution to that end by bringing the stakeholders together to think about principles and a roadmap for the evolution of, of internet. If a bloody war uh, actually outbreaks, the main casualty might be the internet as we know it. It is extremely important that such war does not turn out to be a nuclear war. In this field, the mutual assured destruction doctrine would not work. This is a clear m 
but uh, I, I'd like just to finish the with uh, a very important assertion. Uh, there is a clear malaise uh, with uh, major aspects of internet governance. The book helps us to understand why and what is at stake in the multiple power struggles that characterize such war or wars. A more democratic system of governance is desperately needed to inject a minimum of trust among all stakeholders. This l minimal level of trust is important because uh, without it, I think the alternative is not order. Uh, it will be destructive uh, chaos and fragmentation. Thank you. I don't know if you need a minute to brief after that <laughs> presentation. Benoni, thank you so much. I think it's a privilege to have a representative of the Brazilian government with us today. In the last few months, I've been to many, many <coughs> incountable meetings here in DC discussing what's going on in Brazil and what Brazil can do without any representative. So it's an honor for us and for New America to have, us, uh, to have you with us today. So I want to just uh, go ahead and, and hear from first hand, right? So I want to to move ahead and uh, invite uh, Dr. Richard Bernard to, to, to give his uh, words. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, and it's a great pleasure to be here. We'd like to thank the uh, Alan Davidson and colleagues uh, for this invitation. It's always a pleasure to be with Professor Denardis. It's a stimulation of thought that she always brings to these issues, and uh, as well as a remarkable amount of expertise and, and insight. Um, I will try to be brief since I think that uh, through Professor Denardis' comments as well as my colleague, uh, uh, Counselor uh, Bille, uh, I think we've covered uh, many issues, but I would like to make these points. And that is, first, I think that Professor Denardis has done us all a great um, service um, uh, by introducing a very old notion, and that's geopolitics in the debate. I have watched the evolution of the policy side of the Internet from the moment in which uh, there was a need to be a decision made as to who was going to take over the domain name system when that uh, the structure that John Postel had created and, and transitioned uh, to university and to a private uh, or, or, or into a public organization, then the question became um, who was going to take it over? And that question was, of course, given to the United States government. Um, but from that point, it seems that we had lost sight a little bit of uh, the, the interplay uh, between governments and Internet that have been a part of the origin of the Internet and its evolution um, and that is something that I think Professor Denardis brings back to our attention, uh, which is that you cannot speak about Internet governance um, without speaking about very traditional notions of political theory. Um, I would like to uh, emphasize uh, in my remarks that portion of her extraordinary text uh, page 228, for those of you who are checking whether or not I read the book, <laughs> um, in which she uh, talks about uh, multi-stakeholderism. And there she creates a typology on page 229 in which she says there are certain kinds of multi-stakeholderism. Uh, there is the widely diffused form. Uh, there are the, uh, that uh, which is government-led, and then that which is private sector uh, led. And then she says, multi-stakeholderism directed in a top-down manner or directed broadly uh, rather than at a specific administrative function is usually a proxy for a broader political power struggle. Uh, and of course, she's quite right in that regard. The uh, challenges that we uh, find ourselves in uh, today is precisely trying to understand some fundamental issues uh, of political theory that has to do with what multi-stakeholder means in a very practical sense, and that debate uh, is ongoing. Uh, my colleague from Brazil uh, has indicated uh, that context is everything, uh, and he may be uh, correct in that regard. 
But um, as we look at this issue of multi-stakeholderism, uh, we are going to notice that, in fact, it derives, as at least as we interpret it and as we may have a preference in one direction or the other, it derives uh, from ultimately a broader interest, which is whether or not we see or how we see scarce resources to be distributed. And there are a considerable number of scarce resources identified uh, with the Internet and its management uh, because, of course, uh, we cannot separate currently the Internet from the whole global economic uh, system. But um, what I wish to then uh, say is that as we look at these issues and we understand that there is a geopolitical element to them, that there is a, uh, if you will, a traditional political theory um, associated, uh, uh, associated with these issues, um, we also must say that uh, the, the Internet, uh, whether we speak of it as the Internet or whether we speak of it for those who deploy and use Internet, is still aspirational, which is why I think we're still, we are having the debates that we are having. And it's aspirational in the sense of what we wish um, our societies to become. Um, and we use the debate over Internet governance uh, to um, um, as a means, as she says, as a proxy for the broader uh, political uh, debate. Now, this debate is going to, of course, take place uh, this year uh, at some meetings coming up that have already been described or at least uh, uh, named, uh, which is the plenipotentiary in Busan in, uh, in October, um, and, the, and I would also add the World Summit on the Information Society Review in 2015. I am confident that the issues that Professor Denardis has described so well in her book are going to be at play uh, in those meetings. Um, but I would just conclude by saying that uh, we all should uh, express our appreciation to her again for, as her table of contents indicates, that when you begin to consider issues of standard cybersecurity, free flow of information, critical internet resources, access, um, and um, um, accountability in a sense, you're talking about some fundamental issues uh, of politics and that uh, cannot be separated from the debate on internet governance. Um, so in conclusion, I wish to express my appreciation to again Professor Denardis for uh, bringing a source text to our attention uh, that I know will have an enduring impact uh, upon our thinking. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. And finally, I want to call the last stakeholder in our conversation, <laughs> Civil Society with Emma from CDT. Thank you. Great. Well, and I'll, I'll try to keep this quick so that we can move on to um, discussion with everybody who's here. But uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to join this esteemed panel today um, and to provide some comments on Lara's excellent book. Like all of Lara's work on internet governance, I found it to be a very clear articulation of some tricky and complicated topics. Um, I think in the, so in the, I guess, introduction of the book, you outlined five features of global internet governance um, as a conceptual framework, which are, are reflected in the three themes that you um, mentioned earlier. Uh, and I found these, this framework um, really particularly useful because it helps to tease out the, the different orientations or lenses that different people can bring to the same topic um, or point of debate. We often see debate around governance topics get very muddled very quickly, whether we're talking in DC, in Geneva, or anywhere else in the world. Um, from an advocate's perspective, I think it's extremely helpful to have a framework like this to really sharpen our own understanding of what the real issues are that we're talking about, and also to be able to pinpoint where and how a conversation is, is switching gears. Um, so to take as a, a very non-global example, even just the, the current debate going on in the US around the NTIA's announcement that it's going to transition the IANA functions. And I know that you 
tried not to make your book all about the uh, the I <laughs> functions, but unfortunately we we had the news, so so it's um, what everybody's been buzzing about uh, for the past few weeks. Um, so a as Laura explained, the, um, the, the NTIA has an oversight role in um, the management of the root zone file, control of the authoritative mapping of the names and numbers of the internet for the global internet. Um, so when I hear about the NTIA announcement that they're going to transition this oversight role to the global multi-stakeholder community, I think, ah, this clearly falls in that privatization frame, the privatization of internet governance um, that Laura mentioned, which is not just about shifting things to private companies, but to uh, new institutional forms. Um, and to me is really bound up in this idea of multi-stakeholder um, governance, where with the idea that no particular party, be it government, civil society, industry, or technical experts, necessarily has a determinative role um, in internet governance. The privatization frame is about shifting governance functions out of explicitly government-driven or controlled situations and into something where private non-governmental actors have at least as much say in the process and decision making and implementation. So the NTIA transition is about getting rid of that vestigial formal contractual tie between the US government and the domain name system and is about putting that oversight role in the hands of the global multi-stakeholder community. Um, a community which, though it does include governments as members, um, is decidedly non-governmental or private in nature. So thinking in this frame, the NTIA transition obviously raises all of the usual questions about privatization of internet governance functions, transparency of decision-making processes, participation in agenda setting, defining of a process, as well as the development of proposals and the ultimate decision-making, accountability, who is accountable to whom and through what mechanisms, um, and many other questions. Uh, this is where a lot of the conversation within the internet governance community, within the community of people who already knew about the IANA functions and cared about them, um, that's where a lot of this has been focusing. You know, who's going to run the process? How are they going to run it? Um, what are we even talking about? What's this ultimate entity going to look like? But then we look at popular press coverage of the issue, and it's been discussed almost entirely in the second frame, the propensity to use internet governance technologies as a proxy for content control. And of course, some of this is politically motivated. Um, it's hard to expect the media to, to pass up a good alarmist headline about the government handing over control of the internet to the Russians. Um, but it, it's too easy to dismiss the rhetoric, rhetoric as entirely politically motivated or to just write it off as the result of not understanding the role that the NTIA currently plays or what the IANA functions actually are. I think it's much more useful to actually use the second frame, which has proven true many times over. There is a propensity of governments and others to look at um, governance technologies as a way to exert content control. Uh, and to have that inform our thinking about what are the genuine concerns here. Um, to use that to better inform the discussions of process and accountability that we've already identified you know need to be happening so we should be asking you know how could oversight of the ana functions be used to exert control over online content um, as laura noted there are many free expression implications with having control over the root zone file it's not hard to imagine in a worst case scenario um, that intentional and malicious mismanagement of dns root zone file could have an effect on access to information um, not saying that i think this is a likely outcome of anything but just you know, let's let's think think it through. Um, acknowledge the technological potential for this. Then we can think about important questions for the transition. You know, what's been keeping this doomsday happen scenario from happening so far, and what does all that what does that entail? How do we build those safeguards into the next evolution of oversight of this function? So, from an advocate's perspective, I think being able to clearly pull this apart and articulate it in a non-hyperbolic fashion helps both in responding to the hyperbole that might be used to delay a process and also helps inform the process to make sure that whatever gets developed um, has been, as, uh, as Steve Del Bianco put it at yesterday's hearing um, at the House Energy and Commerce Committee, make sure it's stress tested, make sure it can withstand whatever any party around the world uh, you know, might try to do to it. But I, so I just uh, wrap up by saying that I think, you know, any, anyone involved in this discussion who's trying to insist on putting only their frame on this debate um, is really 
not going to help move the conversation forward. And if we can take something like what Laura articulates in her book and use it to help really elucidate what all is going on here and what are all the different angles and, and potential motivations, we're on a much better track to actually coming up with a good policy solution. Thank you. Thank you, Emma, so much for bringing uh, the public interest perspective to this table. So I'm going to go directly to the questions. I'm dying to ask more about NETIA, but I'm going to leave that a little for later. So I would like you uh, to discuss a little bit with us uh, what do you identify as some of the most shocking political events in the internet history? And anybody can grab the question. I'll jump in there. For me, it was 1988 when I was a graduate student at Cornell and an internet user, and uh, the Morris worm hit, um, because that really shaped my uh, view of how important internet security was. And you know, an estimated 10% of the internet was taken down at the time. Now. Uh, it got traced back to a computer at MIT and then a computer at um, Cornell. And it was another graduate student at Cornell. Um, really shaped my thinking. Um, but, but I do want to say that d you know, it, it really has been in the last five to seven years when the, the starkest events have happened. The cutting off of um, citizen access in Egypt, I would say, is the number one to me. When you think that an entire country's internet access can be taken down, whether withdrawing border gateway protocol routes or by calling up um, a wireless, uh, the president of a wireless company and say, you know, cut this down, I think that tells us and it's a reminder that there are internet choke points. And I do think that the NTIA announcement, I'm going to go right to that. I want to say that um, there are two extreme views of that right now. On one side, it's being described as Obama's internet surrender. <laughs> On the other side, some people, very well-respected people, are saying this is no big deal. And what I would say is this actually is a big deal. It is a big deal in the history of the internet because um, I, I recognize a lot of faces in the room, and I know people have been involved in this um, you know, very closely. Uh, this debate has been going on a long time, and the announcement about the transition, I think it is a big deal, and that the reality is somewhere in the middle. And if all goes well, we'll still, um, you know, as I like to say, we'll still watch Orange is the New Black on Netflix, <laughs> right? It, it will continue to work. But, but it is a big deal, and it has to be very carefully crafted what the new uh, multi-stakeholder oversight will look like. Thank you. Any Anyone else? Additional comments? Any additional comments? No, I don't think I have. I mean, I think Professor Donardis has summarized a number of things. I mean, uh, for every extraordinary technology, and it goes without saying the internet is an extraordinary technology, there is, the, there is a dark side that is possible with it. And uh, if we were to judge what is the most shocking, um, we would begin to expose more about ourselves than I think we wish to in this room in terms of what we see about human behavior. Uh, but uh, regardless, um, let me f focus rather on a, on, a, on a positive note, if I may, because I think Laura has, has summarized it very well with respect to the NTIA announcement. I do think it is a big deal, and I wish to compliment Assistant Secretary Strickling and his staff for, uh, for the courage that they're demonstrating and the interagency process that inevitably led to the decision. It's important um, for a variety of reasons. One is the fulfillment of a promise uh, from 1998 <coughs> uh, that this would be fully privatized. Then the hope was the year 2000, but okay, fine, it's, it's been delayed. Uh, secondly, um, it's been given over to a multi-stakeholder process to come back with a proposal. That's a remarkable, a, an yeah. international multi-stakeholder process to come back with a proposal. That is extraordinary. And the third thing is the United States government has declared um, that uh, there are certain conditions, uh, which is to say that the promise, again, of the Internet uh, will not be lost in this transition, uh, that uh, it cannot be a transition to yet or to a, 
a governmental or intergovernmental organization it has to retain uh, a multi-stageholder na na nature of it. So for those reasons, um, it seems to me that this is a, a remarkable decision that needs to be given its full credit for what it is. And it is not a small thing, it is a big thing. Mm -hmm. I'll leave it at that. Well, it's actually a question I'd love to kind of hear from the room just to get a sense of people generally what they think the most shocking thing is. Um, I, and at the, at the risk of exposing more about myself than, than I might uh, <laughs> think is wise. can be good, I mean, too. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I mean, I, I would, my mind immediately goes to the um, revelations the, uh, back in the fall. Um, one of the, the many revelations that we've gotten from Edward Snowden, but sp thinking specifically of the one um, about NSA subverting encryption um, and intentionally incorporating uh, non-randomness into random number generators to put it at a very high level um, for encryption technologies that form the, um, the, the baseline of not just government to government communications, but the entire global internet for that everyone, government, civilian alike uses. Um, you know, that's when Laura talks about a, a kind of a loss of trust. <laughs> so much of what has happened in internet governance is built on these foundations of trust. And if you have um, subversion of, of fundamental encryption technologies, that's just obviously um, completely counter to that. So, Thank you. Um, Benoni? Well, I, I agree. I think that uh, there are many uh, events that could be uh, identified as being very shocking. But the, the degree of the pervasiveness of, of the mass surveillance that was revealed to the general public and acknowledged so far uh, is something that uh, we would not uh, imagine that it could happen. <coughs> so, and it has implications, of course, uh, for global, co global uh, the governance and, and for uh, national interests of different countries, the privacy of individuals. Um, the sovereignty of uh, states, uh, the um, uh, interests of different companies around the world that were targeted uh, by these um, programs. So this is, I think, uh, really shocking. Thank you very much. I was just speaking there because I want to be sure that I break a little bit the protocol and send <coughs> the opportunity for you guys to ask something and then I'm going to make another question. So do we have any questions? Here, Natalie. I'm going to get one from the audience, and then I'm going to come back, and then there. Uh, thank you. Um, um, is this on? Can yes. anyone hear me? Yes. I'll sp okay. Uh, I'm Dr. David Wood. Among other things, I'm uh, a practicing software engineer, and I work with the W3C. Um, as the Internet becomes uh, governed more internationally, I, I certainly respect the need for the, top, the amount of the degree of top-down governance to increase. Um, however, if we look at the history of the internet, traditional political theory, as Dr. Baird was speaking about, doesn't <coughs> seem to me to deal well with the sort of bottom-up innovation uh, that we've seen on the internet. So uh, Professor Nardis mentioned a BitTorrent, which was developed by a single programmer has never been standardized. Uh, I think if we look back, we could see that the same thing was true with the web. It was a single developer. Uh, same thing with DNS. Same thing with most of the TCP IP family. So we don't have any reason to believe that this development of new protocols, new tools, new techniques, some of which capture hundreds of millions of users in a fairly short amount of time, is in some way slowing. Uh, as a matter of fact, we have reason to believe that the amount of innovation on the internet is in fact increasing. And so I wonder, as we move into this new world of increasing the amount of top-down governance, how we avoid the unintended consequences killing the goose that laid the golden egg. And I hope the panel would be so kind as to respond. I'll be happy to take that, kick off the discussion on that. I think it's, um, you're making an important point, not just um, asking a question. And um, my hope is that we don't get top-down um, 
mandates in, in the standard setting environment and that it changes. Um, do you see any place where that's happening? Um, I see a few places where that's happening. I also see trends away from interoperability. And um, I think that the pace of innovation could really be affected by that, not just um, government top-down mandates, but having greater intellectual property rights that are embedded in standards and the way that that could affect, uh, affect innovation. So having points of control, whether it's government mandates, whether it's top-down um, design of standards, or whether it's intellectual property within the standards itself, um, I think I'm kind of agreeing with, your with what you're suggesting in the question that that would affect the pace of innovation. Let's try to imagine a world in which uh, the some of the standards that um, have been developed over the last 20 years were completely encumbered by, um, by patents? Would we have the internet that we have now? No. If we went, no. If we went, um, if we went with um, open, op open systems interconnection instead of TCP IP, I, st I don't think we would have the innovation that we have now. So having this kind of um, grassroots development of standards is important, but it's also important to have um, the procedural legitimacy for this to ma be maintained uh, primarily in the private sector and through processes. So um, I actually have another book about um, the issue of open standards and um, I, I strongly advocate for having openness in, in development where anyone can get involved. Now granted it takes a lot of technical expertise, it takes money, it takes cultural competency and other things, but having that openness is very important than openness in impl implementation, where the standard is published, whether the, where the public and others can inspect it and have some kind of accountability, and then the openness in, um, in, in how it's used, in that there are multiple competing standards. So it's, you raise a topic that is one of my favorites, and I hope that we continue in a world where we have open standards and grassroots development of them. I, Does I anyone encourage anyone to look at the W3C's patent policy. Sure, because, absolutely. Uh, not all standards organizations deal with that issue well. Yeah. Right. Yeah, just to add a few words, uh, I think a few thoughts about that. Uh, I think that uh, for developing countries, uh, it's really important, not only for developed countries, because uh, the Internet is a tremendous tool for democra democratizing knowledge and the and capacity to innovate. So nowadays you have people in India, in Brazil, whatever, in any place in the world that have access to the internet and can innovate and can be successful in, a, in the world economy. Uh, and we have to preserve that. Mm -hmm. So uh, the whole debate about uh, intellectual property rights uh, has to be updated uh, in, in the light of this uh, tremendous tool that is internet. Uh, if you, we, we don't, don't want to stifle the, the innovation uh, at uh, the global level as well. So I'm going to take the word back and, and, and ask uh, another question. So what do you feel it's missing in this internet governance ecosystem today? I heard the word trust mentioned many times here. Could you comment on that, please? It's trusting what or in who? Does anyone want to take that? <laughs> well, not not to go back to the NTIA transition again, but um, I, it, it, the question reminds me a little bit of um, you know something I noticed at the hearing. So there was a House Energy and Commerce Subcommittee hearing yesterday on this NTIA transition, and the you know go to the hearing. Carolina was one of the um, the witnesses, and and it was a fairly uh, lopsided room. Um, there are lots of members from the Republican Party there um, to ask a lot of questions. But it was really interesting throughout Not the so hearing. Many from the Democrats, too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there were there were there were quite the, some, the, but the, the balls. <laughs> right. Uh, the but balls. It, what was really interesting in watching the panel was hearing in you know in every panelist that that spoke, um, which included Larry Strickling, head of NTIA, um, Fadi Shahade, head of ICANN. Uh, Ambassador David Gross, Carolina, Steve Bianco, everybody was talking about the need for the open and transparent and accountable process. And every question that was coming was about how are you going to ensure this process is open and transparent and accountable? And it's like, okay, good. We're all on the same page here. But what the, the distance I saw was that no matter how much, um, you know, uh, Secretary Strickling and Mr. Jahade were assuring that, you know, we're, don't worry, this process isn't going to rush, we're not going to let anybody run away with the ball here. Um, trust us, 
the response that was coming from at least some of the, um, the members of Congress was, we'd rather have a law that says, you can't do this until we say it's okay. Um, there's a bill that's been introduced. And so that was a sort of like fundamental kind of gap in how do you understand the multi-stakeholder process. It's, if you're going to have a open and participatory way of figuring out what the next step of this is, you have to be willing to come to the table and trust that when everybody else says, yes, we're gonna talk this through, that that's going to happen. Um, it doesn't seem like that trust is quite there yeah. yet. And, sh and to add that the trust is also built through participation, right? I got there a little bit <laughs> from yesterday. The trust is built through participation, right? And one of the things I said was that, you sh of course, the GAO can develop a report. The Congress has the right of ask reports and uh, expert advice, but this should not hold back. You are one more of the stakeholders involved in this in this in this process so do an accountability and openness and transparency so engage with it right so i i i much agree with you uh on on on, on that barrier just one other quick point following up on that because you asked a question about trust but you also tied that into areas that need to be addressed and i would say that the connection between trust and security is uh, something that has not had enough attention and if I think the, in, the internet freedom framing that has been the dominant frame for the last five years has in a way done a disservice by not, by focusing on one um, aspect of the internet and not things that happen in reality um, in the infrastructure sometimes that are not so positive, whether it's um, consumer data breaches or uh, problems between networks at the, ex at the borders uh, where routes can be withdrawn or other, other kinds of security things. So having, uh, moving more into the area of, um, I don't like to use the term weaponization of, of cyberspace, but I do feel that this is an area where we need to place more concern, both from private industry and from civil society, because there are um, increasingly markets for things such as um, knowledge about vulnerabilities in code and protocols. And to say that this is being stockpiled is um, to use a kind of language from another area of society. We don't have the language to describe it yet, yeah. but I think that the, ar the, the cyber armaments, the stockpiling of knowledge about protocol um, vulnerabilities, this is an area that there needs to be more attention that's related to trust. Yes. Yes. Um, so passing the word back to you, any more questions? Not at least on the back there. Well, I really, there we go. Really enjoyed this. Always, um, so you've met here. <coughs> I've heard many of the people speak before, and it's always a pleasure. Um, in particular, um, Dr. Donardis's comment about the uh, variability of multi the application of multi-stakeholderism. In which cases, it's not always the best uh, application or the best solution. However, we might want to focus in on that a little more, especially given that we've got this recommendation for the ANA functions that we now have to talk about. Um, I would like to hear thoughts on perhaps how we might figure out or what kind of procedure or framework we can use to analyze where is multi-stakeholderism multi -stakeholderism appropriate, where is it not, what are the trade-offs of actually implementing it in one place or the other. Now that we've established that multi is not a panacea, we should establish to what extent it is actually helpful or unhelpful. Right. Uh, that, that is uh, the crux of the question going forward. Um, how do you determine which function actually should have multi-stakeholder participation, and if so, how, versus functions that do not have multi-stakeholderism. That's the nature of your question, right? Right, so there are, um, you know, there are a number of ways to divvy that up. One is you can have, is it, a local, is it something that just affects a local entity or something that has global ramifications? Is it something that involves um, critical internet resources that, uh, that have to be globally unique versus things that don't have to be globally unique. You could do it based on the public interest implication of the area. Uh, so there are a lot of ways that you can divide it and I don't really have a good answer. Um, I mean, there are 144 different functions of internet governance, so we have to talk about any particular one. Um, I'll just give you a couple of examples. On one end of the spectrum, I think that 
of applying something like multi-stakeholderism, and this is going to be a controversial statement because I know a lot of people disagree with this, applying multi-stakeholderism in an area such as interconnection is the synonymous with saying that we need government regulation of interconnection. Because right now, it's, um, in many cases, it's private industry making local decisions about how they can join their networks. It's something that has to happen very quickly. If you look at the, what is the problem that's being addressed in any of these areas? If you look at the growth of and spread of internet exchange points, it's been growing very rapidly. Um, there's more interconnection than ever. So in, in an area like that, where it's based in, locally, that could be um, an argument for having um, for, uh, for being okay with the privatization of that. But in an area like critical internet resources and ICANN, that absolutely is an area that has to be multi-stakeholder. Part of it is due to the design of the internet where there's a requirement for global uniqueness in both names and numbers. And part of it is because you need these in order to use the internet at all. You can't route around this system. Now granted in 20 years, maybe we won't have the domain name system anymore and this whole issue will be moot. But right now, this is um, the foundation of the internet and the global u globally unique requirement and the public policy issues at stake. I'd say that that is an area that has to be multi-stakeholder. And I would argue that it already is, that ICANN is multi-stakeholder. It's just a matter of how to shift it um, aw away from the government, uh, U US government oversight. So let me ask you a question. What if at the end of the day, okay, and, and you don't have to answer this, but <laughs> Maybe the ideal situation is for the same people that are in IANA now to continue doing what they do, right? I mean, there are a lot of, it, you, you could argue that it already is multi-stakeholder in some ways. There's uh, some, over, some advisory role of a government, uh, of the GAC, the Government Advisory Committee. There are people with expertise. There are companies that carry out various uh, parts of this, like VeriSign. So it is multi-stakeholder, but what do you replace the uh, contractual relationship of the U.S. with is the question. Uh, does it need to be replaced? What are the alternatives for that? And that's, that's what we don't yet know. And I would say that we're at the beginning of the process and not at the end of it. So you raise the salient question that we'll hear a lot of deliberations about in Brazil and the, at the IGF and going forward. Yeah. Good. Uh, just a quick question and then... Um, so what are, talking about Brazil, what are your hopes uh, for the Net Mundial at the end of this month? And how this announcement can actually be a signal of trust that U.S. is emitting? How do you see all those connected? <laughs> We're looking at uh, yeah. <laughs> the I, I really don't know. We have 187 contributions uh, from various uh, different stakeholders. And there are people that are already uh, trying to figure out uh, areas of consensus, or areas in which there is no consensus at all, uh, things that are more controversial, controversial. Others, I think that what will come up in the end is uh, a few guiding principles for the internet governance, and a few uh, areas in which uh, we can advance more quickly, and others that will require more debate. Uh, I think that, uh, for instance, the Brazilian uh, Internet Steering Committee has submitted its contribution there, and I see that the most uh, of it is about uh, the future of ICANN and how it's going to evolve in the future, and uh, they have some uh, interesting ideas, and they, uh, I saw that they, they quote uh, Dr. Denardis in their uh, official um, contribution. Uh, contribution, so uh, it's very interesting. They defend multi-stakeholderism as something that is important to keep in this, uh, in this area. Uh, although they have uh, specific ideas on how to uh, organize this and, and how it, it should evolve. So I think that uh, it's our hope that uh, this uh, Net Mundial will, uh, first of all, bring uh, everyone together with this new uh, environment in which uh, the uh, U.S. government has uh, been open to discuss the future of uh, of a global or internationalized or globalized uh, ICANN, uh, we will have a, a good environment of trust uh, in order to advance uh, and, 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 and make progress. Uh, that's what I can say for now. <laughs> Thank you. 
Any comments? Well, I have um, actually looked at most and read, I should say read most and looked at all of the 187 contributions. And I, and I would commend them to your attention. They're wonderfully organized on the yes. website uh, by their abstract and, uh, and then the full text. But I do commend them to your attention because as um, consistent with this discussion this afternoon, they are a snapshot or a reflection of the, uh, the a first, the aspirations of a large section of those involved, uh, stakeholders involved in the internet as to what they want the internet to be, how they want it to govern. Um, I was fascinated by the extent to which rights uh, was mentioned uh, uh, by various contributions. Uh, some very prominent contributions spoke exactly the language of Professor Donardis uh, by saying that um, uh, there is always a policy side to every technical issue and how do we manage that. So in, in many ways I think, uh, uh, again the compliments to the government of Brazil for bringing this meeting together uh, and I think it has already achieved a remarkable um, a remark it already has a remarkable achievement in the sense that uh, the texts that have been contributed to the meeting will, I think, be, should be studied and looked at uh, going forward to help answer many of these very complex uh, questions that are being posed in the room uh, today. Um, so in any case, uh, I have found it very enlightening to consult the website and congratulations, I offer the congratulations to the government of Brazil for this achievement. Can I say in, in addition to, um, to those points, uh, just to kind of pick up on something that, that Carolina mentioned about um, kind of trust and comfort with the multi-stakeholder model. So ever since this you know, Brazil summit was announced um, back right around the, the IGF, uh, last year, many of us have been working very, very hard to make sure that it's you know, multi-stakeholder all the way down, that the um, committees to figure out the agenda, to figure out the process for submissions, that it's, it wasn't ever you know, any one entity's meeting or any one government's meeting. Um, so there's already been a significant multi-stakeholder process around the meeting, and the meeting itself is going to be the same sort of thing. And I think, I'm hoping that it will be a good example, particularly to the governments who attend, um, of, of what this slippery multi-stakeholderism concept means. Um, you know, if you compare going to an IETF meeting to going to a meeting hosted at the UN, procedures are very, very different. Um, the way a meeting happens, how people respond to each other, how people interact to each other, um, you know, to take two extremes, it's just complete, completely different worlds. And so I think part of the um, stumbling block that we run into when um, you know, if you're in civil society and trying to advocate against a purely intragovernmental model, um, even explaining what this, this multi-stakeholder thing is um, can be very difficult. Uh, and so I hope that this gives a little bit of that, that participation, that direct first-hand experience with what does it mean to sit at the table as equals and um, talk about key points, talk about our aspirations, talk about where we see um, things that can be approved. Uh, and, and get, get everyone a little bit more habituated to that. Thank you. So back to you, just behind you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. The U.S. has derived considerable benefits from its major role in sort of creating much of the Internet. And I can, I'm, cannot picture key other countries, China, Russia, maybe Brazil, continuing to be happy with that situation, this unlevel playing field. So my question is, how strong is the international pressure from other countries to change this, to reduce the U.S. influence dominance? Let me just um, <coughs> kind of probe your question a little bit, because it, it's, it's kind of, there are two issues there. One is, I don't know that I would say that the, the U.S. government has derived economic benefit from the oversight of the root zone file and things like that. I, I don't, I, I think that all governments have derived um, benefit from that and the, the U.S. government has done an excellent job uh, managing that process. Part of the reason we take it for granted is because it's been run so well and it's like an IT manager in a way. You don't know they're there until your network goes down and then suddenly there's a problem. <laughs> 
but it's, it's been run very well. So I would say that um, all, all governments have derived benefit from the domain name system and from the way that it has been run over time. Um, so what, do you want to ask a... Well, let's say yeah. from a security point of view, sure. something like, I don't know the number, you, you're the experts, a, a majority of messages from Moscow to Kiev go through Northern Virginia. <laughs> that helps NSA. I don't think the Russians like that. And the same, like in Brazil, 95% uh, of our websites are actually hosted in U.S. And 90% of our traffic just pa do right. pass through U.S. So we do have that. Yeah. We are now developing international backbones and also ex local IXPs to change a little bit that situation. But I mean, it used 20 years ago when there were 13 B servers, root servers, the vast majority were in the U.S. Very few overseas. I don't know right. the situation. Today. Yeah, the, well, uh, that, that's right. The historic reality <laughs> is that the internet sprang from. Uh, yeah, we're, we're here outside of Herndon and Reston, and you know, a lot has been happening in this area. So there's the historic trajectory. But it's also very important to disaggregate things yeah. like um, the physical infrastructure from the virtual management of critical internet resources because I. I really do think those are completely separate issues. And so the way that, uh, for example, IP addresses are distributed um, is a different issue from um, how domain name, from, from how the DNS is distributed uh, across various servers and run by various registries. Still completely separate issue from interconnection and how undersea cables are routed and the system yeah. of internet exchange points. So in each of those areas, there are questions about um, the nature of how it's grown, the, the regional geopolitics of it. So I, I would just say that the, um, the root zone file and the, um, the management of critical internet resources, if you just think of that, about that as one issue, that it has been run very well and that the U.S. government has derived a lot of, uh, that we, the U.S. people and the U.S. economy, has deri we've derived a lot of benefit, but equally so, other countries have. So it's in the best interest of every country for it to continue to be run very well. We don't want to take it for granted and want the stability and the security of that particular area of internet governance to m go on into the future. Seems to me, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. Please, I, I've already spoken no, a number of times. <laughs> no, go ahead, please. No, it is that I, I, the questions that you ask and the gentleman in the, uh, in the, uh, in this, in the back about uh, what type of multi-stakeholder should we have. Um, you know, it, it, I think part of the discussion that we will increasingly have, and the Net Mundial meeting has created the context for it, and other meetings that we're going to have in the next two years and, and more, uh, and I might say the uh, discussion that NTIA has started as a result of this announcement. One of the things I think, let me speak just as an American in this context, if I may. For my many years that I spent at the OECD, um, I watched the debate there, and one issue that there, let me say there were two issues that fascinated the now I think 33 countries around the table. One, why is it that if you introduce the same technology that is used in the United States into a European office, you do not get the same productivity that you get out of the United States office in the United States? The second point is, how is it that Silicon Valley came into existence? And why can't we in France, in this particular case, recreate a Silicon Valley? I recall the French government decided they were going to have a Silicon Valley, so they invited entrepreneurs to come to the stadium outside of Paris, which you may know on the way to Charles de Gaulle Airport that you'll see on your right, and there they had a festival of entrepreneurs, and from that they were hoping to create the Silicon Valley. Americans should, I hope in this discussion, do not lose sight of the context by which the internet and other aspects of our innovations at the edges, as my colleague from uh, the World Wide Web referred to, some of which we did not create in this generation. We inherited it. I commend to your attention uh, de Tocqueville's extraordinary journals on the United States. 
And one of the observations he made was he had never been in a country where people so easily organized themselves for common purpose. He was amazed at the at writing of his time that there was, he didn't have the term, a multi-stakeholder environment already in existence that Americans as a culture find very easy. Now let me go back to that office experience, which I've had this discussion at length in, at the OECD. And my European friends will say the following. You know what the difference is? And I said, no. They said the following. In Europe, if you have a staff meeting, one person tends to speak. If you go to a staff meeting in the United States, it's a cacophony of voices around the room trying to solve the problem. So here's what I'm, I, I wish to say. Amidst all of this discussion about the internet, about multi-stakeholderism and about foreign views of the United States. We should never lose sight as Americans that there is something organic about our culture that has allowed this to come about, the internet, and that it, there is something about our culture and our society that has allowed it to flourish. And we should not apologize for that, but rather use it as a point of discussion with other countries that if you want a Silicon Valley, you've got to have a free flow of information between three primary institutions, the universities, the private sector, and the government. And I will challenge most countries, including those of my friends around the OECD, to say, to what extent do you have a free flow of information between those three institutions, because if you don't have it, you're not going to have a Silicon Valley. So uh, I just wish to make that point uh, that we don't lose in addressing your very good point, that with the challenges that are going to be coming towards the United States in the, in the years to come, in the months to come, we should not lose sight of that organic quality that we have as a society and we should not hide from it as being one of our virtues, if I may say, sounding very patriotic, but I do think it's a, it also has a substantive point to it. That you, that, that this does not happen by chance, and you cannot just simply create it by fiat, by declaring, we will now have a Silicon Valley. It doesn't work that way. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Thank you. I actually heard the. Uh, a similar story from uh, Andrew Harry, who is the head of the ICC chapter here in DC, and he was actually the, uh, he was invited to live in Singapore for a couple of decades exactly to structure their regulatory uh, system. And I have the, pla uh, the honor to have lunch with him a couple of times, and then he told me, when I was in the office, everybody was quiet. And I would make a question, and they would not answer me. <laughs> And so I, I provoked them, saying, or you make a question, or you leave the meeting. Then he injected that culture. So it's, 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 it's really amazing, and it's, it's really uh, true in many cultures. Uh, so I just want to get a last question from the audience, and then I think it's, it's, it's time uh, to end after that. Maybe this will be a good concluding question. So apologies to conflate uh, paradigms. But um, just for a broad take, I mean, you raise a lot of issues and a lot of troubling things that could happen, could not happen. But are you sort of optimistic about the future? I mean, are we going to get stuff, uh, technology developments that are going to solve all, um, all these sorts of problems? Uh, do you see everything taking a turn for the worse and all the scary things that have been revealed over the past um, few years uh, coming true? Like, what, what are your guys' Um, forecasts, I guess. I, I'm very optimistic, cautiously optimistic, and I, I will say this, that I raised uh, a number of issues of things that could happen, and I decided to just have it in the last chapter, because I wanted the rest of the book to explain that there are these systems that keep the internet operational, and um, t the, the truth is that at the very core of me, I'm an engineer, and I appreciate the amount of um, design 
and intelligence that has gone into the system, not just in the technologies, but in the, in, in the innovations and governance. So I feel that we have a good history, a good track record, and um, th I am optimistic. But that being said, we can't just take this for granted. The reason that things have run fairly smoothly is because of certain c forms of um, innovation, certain forms of governance, and as Dick said so well, the free flow of information. So it's um, the, the main message is to not take that all for granted and to be careful in how things proceed. That's, that's why even with something so um, on the plate right now as the NTIA transition, it's, it is a big deal. Yeah. And it's not right what people are saying, that this is just, you know, there, there's no big deal here at all. That's not right, any more than it's right to say that this is an internet surrender. So that moving forward as grown-ups, figuring out how to preserve the free and open internet is the task that we have as this generation. That's very good. And, and, um, and if I may, uh, bringing back a little bit the NTIA um, issue, um, it is a big deal and has an incredible symbolic uh, meaning to it. Uh, while the functions can be small, the symbolic is, is what we are talking, that's the big deal. And you are right that some countries, including non-democratic countries, have been using this as an excuse to push for issues in the ITU, for example. So there is a geopolitic here, and I do like that view a lot, and how things represent. We need to be aware of the symbolism of all the debate we have internet governance and how this affects the geopolitics of it. So these are my life thoughts. So yeah, I'd, I'd like to, to add just uh, another idea. I think that this has to, to be a global conversation uh, because, you know, uh, even though the internet is stronger here, it, it was born here and the U.S. has a, a pivotal role and takes a lot of advantage, economic advantage, other countries as well, uh, it is important not to um, mimic the same kind of, uh, of reasoning that I, we, I've, uh, we've, we've seen in other uh, fora and in other situations. Uh, for instance, uh, I the other day I read an article that referred to uh, human universal human rights as if those rights were those enshrined in the U.S. Constitution. Uh, so with no reference to uh, the, the international s system of uh, protection of human rights, universal declaration, the, the international covenants on civil and political rights, and other, uh, and the whole building of, of conventions and, and pacts that are important as well. So when we talk about trust here, we must uh, take into account the fact that this is must be a global conversation or this uh, governance or this conversation will not uh, uh, bring about uh, you know, a, a stable, open internet for everyone. Because now we cannot have just an open internet uh, uh, in the United States. We have to, to, to fight for an open, secure, in the uh, internet uh, uh, all over the world. And for that to happen, we have to, to have a global conversation with all stakeholders, not in the, only in the United States. That's a little bit the trust issue, I think, has to do with that. Uh, showing that uh, it's not only uh, through action, but also through symbolism. Even though the U.S. is not uh, having a very important role with regard to, to a root, root zone file, the fact that there is this uh, link, it, it undermines some th the trust from abroad. And the fact that ICANN uh, is incorporated uh, according to the laws of, of uh, California poses a problem for several countries as well. Because of course there is an advantage that it's the, the American legal system. So uh, these issues must be uh, taken into account uh, in the way that if the U.S. wants to be trusted, must be also willing to uh, uh, have this global conversation and find global solutions for, for the issue, not, not, not just imposing a top-down uh, solution that is uh, crafted uh, inside the United States. I think that's uh, what uh, th this announcement uh, proves, is that there is political will to do that. And that's why I think that the environment for the net mundial is much better now. Yeah. And I think that we're going to have 
a good conversation in Brazil. Thank you. Your final remarks? Yeah. Any final remarks? Yeah, I think those two comments. Yes. So anyway, I want to thank you so much. I, it was an incredible honor to host you here today. And it uh, was amazing uh, class to hear to all of you. And thank you so much for all of you who stayed with us until the end. Thank you. <laughs>